Before we start this podcast, I want to definitely remind you of a sponsor for Fresh of the Word, 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams, along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest. In the world of wrestling, where there's hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads, don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20x20 20 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. So if you'd like to discuss a possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or even Zubaz, then drop them a line at 20x20apparel.com. That's the number 20x, the number 20apparel.com. And also check out their enamel pin line. It's super cool. Fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suckers bum me, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell at one of those. You see me shining like a suit on puppy. You know my grind and shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kids, you can't cop it tomorrow. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 God damn it, we fresh. All right, welcome to the Fresh of the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier, and we're talking more Astronomicon in this episode, and we got a great guest for this episode. We got Bill Mosley. You you, uh, might recognize him as uh, Chop Top from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and then also as Otis from Three from Hell and House of a Thousand Corpses and The Devil's Reject. Yo, how's it going, Bill? Hey, it's going good, man. That's a that's a scary uh, it's a scary resume. Oh yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. You're gonna be uh, coming uh, coming here to Michigan for uh, Astronomicon. You've been there before. You're a you're a veteran of Astronomicon. You know what was your what's your f- thoughts and feelings about Astronomicon? Well, first of all, I love Michigan. Um, I actually was just uh, doing a movie uh, uh, called Handy dandy um last year in detroit okay it just came out finally um and uh it was like an evil puppet movie which of <laughs> course was <laughs> right up my alley um also i have an uncle that lives in the uh, gross point farms uncle bill who uh, just turned 90 Yo, and, shout out uh, to uncle bill like- yeah shout out to un- uncle bill uncle bill yeah and also uh you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I love Michigan, so I say uh, I'm from uh, northern Illinois. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm not a not a Lions fan. I'm a Bears fan, but, uh, you know, I hate black and blue division. Oh, well. <laughs> and, yeah, I know. I, I can't I can't be perfect. I mean, who but, really uh, wants to be a Lions fan, though, man? We just, like, we just, we Lions fans because uh, we, uh, you know, we, we got hope, but, you know, they, they always hurting us. Yeah, that was hurt our feelings. I, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you know. I don't know what's happened, man. I, you know, I, I, we could. I, I guess that's a different, different podcast. Is uh, <laughs> you know, talking uh, lions, bears, because we both have a lot to. We both have a lot to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm gonna. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing Uncle Bill. Also, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that Astronomicon is in Sterling Heights because, of course, uh, Sterling is the home of Doctor Kavorkian. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. He's from Sterling, man. So uh, you know, all of that is good. And again, it's it's good to get back to uh, the Midwest to my roots. Um, I've been living in Los Angeles for thirty years, and you know, like on a day like today, you know, it's sixty five, seventy degrees. The sun is shining. Oh. There's a beach. You know, I mean, I I don't want to torture you guys, but you know, oh, yeah. palm trees. 
I wonder why I moved out here. <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid, that was one of my jobs was shoveling off the walk when, I, when it would snow. And actually, that was one of my dad's, uh, you know, one of those one of those phrases that you remember for life. And uh, one of dad's uh, phrases was plow with the storm. Oh. And the idea being that once it starts to snow, you get out and you start plowing the driveway. Because if you wait for it to accumulate, it's a lot harder. Plow with the storm. So I came out to Los Angeles where, yeah, we got earthquakes and fires and mudslides, but uh, you don't have to plow with the storm out here. Nah, nah, nah. At least in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a plus. That's a plus. <laughs> yeah. Of course, we don't have seasons either. I mean, you know, you can tell it's fall. That's when the, you know, the leaves fall onto the astroturf. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! So, yeah, that's an old Johnny Carson joke. Yeah. So coming up on uh, Astronomicon, you're going to be uh, doing photo ops as both Chop Top. And then also a uh, a dual photo op for uh, Three from Hell with uh, Richard Brake. You know, you know how do you you know what's uh you know what's your thoughts feelings you know about doing these uh, photo ops and these uh, characters that's become so popular. Well, I think with the the one with Richard Brake is a non costume photo op, so it's just going to be two smiling young men standing there, you know, menacing with you know poor fans in between us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, with the chop top. Um, I'm actually, uh, you know, I've got the uh, I've got the original Chop Top costume, so that'll be a part of it. I still have the coat hanger and the teeth and everything. Okay. And uh, the makeup is being done by a woman named Nora Hewitt, who uh, actually won one of the seasons of that old TV show called Face Off. So she is a really, you know, high pro makeup person. And doing the uh, Chop Top makeup is uh, complicated. You know, it's one thing if you did like Otis, say, from House of a Thousand Corpses, that black and white makeup. It's not really that hard to do. Yeah. And you just, you know, throw on like a corn silk wig and, you know, a little red robe and there you go. But with Chop Top, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's the plate. You got to blend that in. You got, uh, you know, little strands of hair. You got the makeup on the, you know, the face and the hand. So it's it's a lot more complicated. And Nora is really good at it. So. You know, that's that's what excites me. Uh, lamentably, that's going to mean uh, chopping off the beard. But, uh, you know, we got to, you know, got to suffer for our art. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the Chop Top character was like your big break. You know, looking back to that movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and the fact that after all these years, people want to like, like have photos with Chop Top. You know, what kind of go, you know, what's your feelings about that? I feel good. I mean, I love Chop Top and Chop Top's never been too far for me, you know, for the last, you know, what is it? It came out in 86. So is that like 30, almost 34 years ago? Yeah. Really seems like only yesterday. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I like the fact that, uh, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, uh, video cassettes and, DVDs and streaming and whatever else they'll come up with, uh, that uh, Chainsaw 2 is, is very much alive and well. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy about that because I love Chop Top, and Chop Top, as I say, never really that far from me, you know, low these past 34 years. Um, I'm only sorry that they, you know, the Chop Top is kind of one and done. Um, I would have loved to have done more with Chop Top. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just uh, the movie gods decreed that, uh, you know, that wasn't going to be the case. Uh, but I do like, uh, you know, I, I, you know, as I say, I like to go when I go to the uh, conventions. Uh, you know, a lot of people love Chop Top and come up to the table and I'm always happy to say, dog will hunt or get that <laughs> bitch or lick my plate, you dog dick. <laughs> so it's. It's always right there, you know. So yeah. I'm happy that uh, Chop Top keeps getting the love. You know, how did you uh, how did how did you get score that role in uh, Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre Two? You know what happened? Um, you know, I uh, made a short film about two years before we did Chainsaw Two, and I made a short film called The Texas Chainsaw Manicure, 
which was set in a beauty parlor where a woman goes in, gets her <laughs> hair done. She's sitting under the dryer. She wants a manicure. The beautician calls to the back of the shop, manicure. And you hear this uh, chainsaw roaring up. And then there's this sliding silver door out of homage to the original chainsaw. And uh, out from the back of the shop comes Leatherface with a smoking chainsaw. And uh, he comes up to this poor lady who's sitting under a dryer. <laughs> And he starts uh, sawing on her fingers, and uh, she's screaming, and a lot of mayhem, and then she passes out, and uh, and they revive her. They slap her face a little bit and revive her, and she's like, no, no, oh, oh. <laughs> and she looks down. She's got, that like, the perfect manicure, and uh, she goes out very happy with her new hairdo and her new manicure to uh, to show her husband, who's there to pick her up in a pickup truck. And uh, that was my cameo as the hitchhiker with a wine mark on my cheek and the whole deal. And she comes out. She goes, look, honey, I got the best manicure ever. And she shows me her manicure. And I go, hey, that's great, honey. We should celebrate with some head cheese. <laughs> and uh, I actually went out and bought some head cheese, like a, a lump of it. Uh, and, you know, on, on screen, you know, on camera, it's not really that exciting. It just looks like, uh, like bologna or something like that. But, uh, you know, we know that it's like eyeballs and scrotums and, you know, all kinds of everything you don't need. And, you know, from any other, you know, cut of meat, <laughs> it's like all that's left, they just grind up and turned it into head cheese. And, uh, and one of the takes, I actually licked it, which I, I don't really recommend unless you're into that kind of thing. But um, anyway, a friend of mine, I, I just, I, I made this five minute short. I tried to sell it to like Saturday night live. And there was a show called Fridays back then. And nobody really wanted it because uh, it was either too long or it was on tape instead of film, and, you know, all these different things. So nobody wanted it. So um, I was working at the time for a magazine. I was a freelance writer and I had a job from uh Omni Magazine, which is a science science fiction mag, right. put out by Penthouse actually, and um, and I had a I was on a junket to L.A. to uh, cover the making of uh, 2010, the Space Odyssey sequel, and um, I ended up uh, bringing a VHS copy of the Manicure out with me, and I had dinner with a friend of mine an old high school chum who had gone out and become a hot shot uh, screenwriter in, in uh, Hollywood. <laughs> and I had dinner with him and his wife and I brought along the manicure and showed them the manicure. And he said, I love this. Uh, why don't you give me a copy of the manicure? Because my partner and I have an office right across the hall from Toby Hooper, who directed, of course, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right. And it turns out that uh, Toby was um, working on Poltergeist. And he was there with his producing partner, uh, Steven Spielberg. Oh. And the two of them watched the manicure. They loved it. And uh, Toby especially loved my cameo as the hitchhiker. And uh, I ended up talking to him on the phone. My, my buddy got me his phone number, too, and I called him up and identified myself. And he said, Oh man, I love that. I love the hitchhiker. And he told me to stay in touch. He, Toby, um, you know, he said, if I ever do a sequel, I'll keep you in mind. And I said, great. You know, and, I, and then I didn't hear from him for two years. So <laughs> I kind of thought that trail had gone pretty cold. And, uh, and then one night I got a call from uh, the screenwriter, Kit Carson, asking me where to send a copy of the script. And, uh, you know, I was in New York at the time, and uh, so I gave him my address. And sure enough, a couple of days later, the script showed up. He told me to keep an eye on Chop Top. And I looked at it, and I thought, holy shit, that's a big part. <laughs> and um, the next call I got was from Canon Films Legal Department, you know, asking if I had an agent or if I wanted to negotiate my own contract. So that was kind of the story. And then I just, you know, I ended up getting the job through uh, the Chainsaw Manicure, and I showed up uh, in the spring of 86 in Austin, Texas, and uh, they shaved my head. Tom Savini and his his uh, gang of <clears throat> special effects makeup guys, <laughs> they shaved my head and they made a head mold out of me and they created the plate and the teeth and the whole deal. And I was just really off and running. Nice, nice, nice. But I, I owe so much of the uh, of the of Chop Top. 
like 95% of it was inspired by the great Ed Neal, who, of course, played the hitchhiker in the original Chainsaw. You know, and every time I talk about Chop Top, I always, uh, I, I don't fail to mention uh, Ed because he was, uh, his character was such a great inspiration. There's a, there's another role that I want to talk talk to you about that you uh, that you had that uh, a friend of mine, uh, comic book uh, author David Hayes, wanted me to talk to you about, and that is about your uh, role as Luigi Largo in uh, Repo, the genetic opera. What was your experience with that movie? Uh, that was a lot of fun. I, it was fun working with uh, Darren Lynn Bowsman, the uh, the director. Uh, we shot it in Toronto. Um, I got the part. I remember, um, Darren coming up to me at a convention, I think, and saying, Hey, I'm doing this movie, uh, called repo. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a character, uh, you know, it's, it's a musical, it's an opera. So everybody sings <laughs> and, uh, you're, you know, you're, you, you'd be this character and he described Luigi Largo. And, uh, and he said, um, he said to me, he said, I know you can kill, because I've seen your stuff on screen. I know you can kill, but can you sing? And I said, well, you know, and I, I had given him a couple of uh, Cornbug CDs, this band I used to have with uh, Buckethead. Okay. And I said, well, Darren, I gave you these Cornbug CDs. He said, yeah, I know, but can you sing? I was like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> so um, the good news is I, I can sing, and I've... Uh, you know, for all aspiring actors, et cetera, um, one of the things I do to stay prepared, you know, I go to the gym three times a week. Uh, and one of the things I do is I take a singing lesson and have for many years, okay. uh, once a week. And uh, so I, I said, well, yes, I do sing, Darren. He said, well, good. You can show up at the studio. We're having these auditions. So show up and, uh, and here's a song I want you to prepare. So he gave me this song from repo. And, um, I took it to my singing teacher. And so we worked on it. We spent a whole, uh, half hour, one, one or two of my lessons working on not only, uh, singing the song, but also, you know, the dramatic, you know, you start soft and end loud, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever the song required to really be a convincing song. And, um, I went to, uh, the audition and uh, one of the pussycat dolls uh, was actually ahead of me. And so I was up in the, <laughs> the sound booth looking down in this uh, sound studio and she was at, at the headphones on the microphone, the whole deal. And she was singing and dancing. I was like, I am fucked. I'm not going <laughs> to get this part. No, no way I'm getting this. You know, I, mean, I have to follow a pussycat doll. Are you kidding me? You know, the, the good news is it wasn't for the same part. But uh, I was like, holy shit. So uh, but anyway, I went down. They said, OK, Bill, you're next. You know that, you know, it's just uh, that, those words of dread. You're next. <laughs> OK, it's time. You know, when I hear that, I think it's time to die. Basically, it's time to be it's time to humiliate yourself and not get the job and have everybody laugh at you and then and then talk shit about you because you couldn't. You know, anyway, that's where my head is at. So I'm, I'm full of nerves and, you know, I'm an insecure actor and I go down and uh, they, they put the headphones on me and, you know, I've got the lyrics and everything and, and they say, well, let's just do some testing, you know, with the microphone. And, uh, you know, I, so I spoke into the microphone and something magic happened because it was like, like the best microphone in the world. Oh. And I started to, you know, say, you know, hum a little bit or do, you know, just talk. And it was like, wow, I sound great. What is, what is up with this microphone? And, uh, and so they, they played the song through the headphones and I sang along and, you know, I had prepared, but, uh, even so, you know, I just, I, I was just in love with my own voice because this microphone was amazing. It was like singing in the shower times 10, where you really <laughs> just suddenly hit all the high notes and it just sounds fantastic. Right. So I, I really give I give so much credit to my repo job to that golden microphone. Um, I haven't I haven't seen it since, but 
you know, that night, that, that magic microphone. And so uh, when I was finished, I remember taking off the headphones and looking up into the control booth and, and Darren and, and the music director, Joe Bashara and Darren's co-writer, Terrence Zadunich and Darren Smith, who, you know, created the repo in the first place. All of them are looking They're They're looking down at me. They're all smiling and their <laughs> thumbs are all pointed up. Nice. I thought, well, fuck that fucking microphone, man. <laughs> so that's how I got the job. Yeah. <laughs> that golden microphone. Talk more about this band, the corn bugs that you were, uh, that you had, you know, what, what, you know, how did that band farm? Um, I was doing a play in LA back in like 90, 1990. Um, and it was a play in a, in a very small theater. <clears throat> Excuse me. The play was called, uh, Timothy and Charlie. And it was about Timothy Leary and Charles Manson, who back in 1974, I think, actually spent a night side by side in uh, solitary in San Quentin prison. Oh. And, uh, and, and based on that historical fact, there's no history that says they even knew that or talked to one another or anything like that. But based on that historical fact that they were side by side in San Quentin, uh, this playwright made up, a, it was like a two act play about the two of them, Timothy and Charlie, side by side, talking to each other and kind of uh, you know, having this this discussion about, you know, taking drugs. You know, Timothy Leary would say, like, it's it's so that you can expand your consciousness and be a better human. And Charles Manson's pounding his chest going, I did it because I felt good. You know, <laughs> this, this crazy show. And uh, anyway, the, the actor that played uh, uh, Charles Manson, a guy named Gil Gale, uh, was friends with Buckethead. I'd never heard of Buckethead. Um, and Buckethead, you know, showed up at one of the shows and came backstage to see his buddy Gil and wanted to be introduced to me because it turns out Buckethead was a big Chop Top fan. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we met and I said, hey, how, how you doing? Oh, it's Buckethead. Oh, well, great. You know, whatever. And uh, anyway, so Buckethead, you know, I was told he was this, you know, great guitar player and everything. I, I, I believed it. I said, okay, yeah, good. And Buckethead, uh, you know, proposed that I come down and go off, quote unquote, on some, uh, some music that he'd recorded. So I said, you yeah, know, sure. He was down in Santa Monica, or at least that's where his studio was. So I said, sure. So I went down a couple of days later after we had talked about it. I remember driving down. I had my bongos in the car and, uh, you know, I got a coffee at McDonald's and showed up at this, you know, this guy's apartment that had like recording equipment in it. And, um, you know, Buckethead started playing some stuff and I started doing stuff as Chop Top, just, you know, kind of making stuff up. And, um, <laughs> and Buckethead liked what I was doing and I like Buckethead. I like, you know, the, the music was really cool. And so, uh, you know, uh, Buckethead ended up calling, uh, calling me and asking me to, you know, if I wanted to come to New York and, uh, and, and, and do vocals on a, a track or two on his album that he was recording, I think at the time for Sony records. Okay. And, uh, it was called giant robot. And so I said, yeah, sure. That'd be great. So I was very excited. Uh, you know, I was going to be a rock star, <laughs> really, you know, <laughs> a lot of big ideas. And, um, and Buckethead, uh, wanted me to, you know, basically appear as chop top on his record. And I remember just before getting on the plane to New York, I remember, which is where he was recording the, the album. I remember calling a friend of mine who was a uh, professor of uh, copyrights, uh, copyright law at uh, Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles. Okay. My old college buddy, Jay. And I said, hey, Jay, I uh, just wanted to run this by you. I'm, I'm about to go and do this gig as Chop Top. And you know, I don't own the rights to Chop Top. I mean, obviously, that's you know the movie company, but I'm just wondering if I can still do that. And he said, well, you know, uh, no, you can't. <laughs> I was like, whoop. And he said, uh, he said, you know what I would do is uh, just to be, just to play it safe. I would just uh, you know, come up with a different character. 
And I went, oh, okay, thanks a lot. And I hung up the phone. And I thought, come up with a different character. Oh, boy. You know, I, this job top, it's my only character. That, that's my character. <laughs> you know, come up with a different character. So anyway, so I got on the plane. You know, I didn't want to tell Buckethead that because I wanted to fly to New York. Yeah, I got on the plane. I was thinking, like, on the plane from L.A. to New York, I'm thinking, come up with a different character. So I started thinking about it. And um, I... Uh, you know, I, I thought about, I saw like a farm, like a ranch. Somehow I, I started thinking about ranch hands and I started thinking about these, you know, severed hands that were crawling around the ranch hands. And <laughs> then I was starting to think, then I started to think about this scarecrow and I thought uh, scarecrow. And then I thought scare and I just thought this, I uh, thought shoe bird, S-H-O-O-B-I-R-D, like scarecrow, shoe, bird. And uh, so I had this idea about, you know, this scary scarecrow shoe bird. That would be my character. And uh, I remember getting to New York. I got to the hotel. Buckethead had just come back from, you know, 12 hours in the studio, you know, slaving away on his album. He was happy to see me. He was excited because I was going to do Chop Top. And I saw him and I uh, I said, hey, man, how's it going? And we were having a chat. And I said, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I can't do Chop Top because I don't have the Bucket had literally his face darkened. I, I've never seen that before. So, so <laughs> pronounced like he just, his, I mean, he's just, he, he darkened because it was like such bad news. Wow. And, uh, and he didn't say anything, but he just literally darkened. Uh, the light went out of his face and eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Oh no. You know, cause I, I'm looking at my rock star, you know, fantasy, you know, fading quickly. And, uh, and I said, but, but I got this other character. Um, it's a scary scarecrow. I call him a uh, shoe bird and buckethead, you know, he's not really getting any lighter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, Oh no, you know, here it goes. And I'm trying to dance as hard as I can to try to keep his, you know, keep from just, you know, the ax falling on my neck. And, uh, you know, I'm just about, you know, I just, I've just about given up and, and buckethead goes, um, I got a name and I said, Oh really? You know, <laughs> like, what is it? He goes, no, no. I said, no, no, really. What is it? He goes, no. I said, what is it, man? My whole career has been, you know, that's what I'm thinking. And, uh, and he looks at me, he goes, onions, <laughs> I go, onions, onions, the scarecrow. I said, wow, <laughs> that's actually awesome. Onions. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And so uh, in that moment, <laughs> Onions the Scarecrow was born. And if you listen to the Giant Robot album, which took a couple of years to come out finally, but if you listen to it, there's a, there's a song on it called Onions Unleashed, Oh, spelled o- O-N-L-E-A-S-H-E-D, Onions Unleashed. And, um, and, you know, he just played some music. I went off as Onions. I didn't have anything written, but I just, you know, I had an idea. So I just started making stuff up. And, um, and that's really what, that's what ended up happening was, uh, Buckethead, uh, and I, you know, just, you know, we were able to communicate and, uh, you know, when he started playing something that inspired me and I started making stuff up and it worked. And, uh, I remember when I, I first started doing conventions, um, I saw that everybody, all the actors were just selling, basically signing eight by tens of themselves. Right. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have like some kind of uh, extra thing on the table? And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have like, uh, like some cassettes, you know, back in the cassette days yeah. of, uh, of like some music and, uh, you know, we should, I should do something with Buckethead. So I, I called him up and, um, and we, uh, you know, started to play. Uh, he had a, uh, you know, a rehearsal studio, you know, about an hour outside of LA. I was, I drove to, and we started making stuff up and recording stuff. And, um, he came up with the name corn bugs. We did a, a video at, at Buckethead's parents house in, uh, <laughs> in, in somewhere, somewhere in the Valley in California. And uh, his parents had some, uh, had some corn plants. They were really tall. And I was, kind of goofing around in the corn plants and I, there was an ear of corn and I, you know, I, I bent it over and it said, you know, calling all cars, like it was a microphone. <laughs> and then I, I looked at this the ear of corn that was still on the plant and everything, but it, you know, I kind of peeled it back a little bit and there were all these fucking bugs on it. 
I went, corn bugs, corn bugs. And, uh, and that's when Buckethead realized that that, was, that that should be the name of the band <laughs> based on some funky corn in his mother's vegetable garden. And uh, that was it, man. We, uh, you know, we cranked him out for about 10 years after that. Great, great. Yeah, you, um, yeah now you, know, you go do these uh, conventions, these um, pop culture conventions, horror conventions, you know, your Chop Top or your Otis. You know, people want to come out to, uh, you know, see you, to, you know, chop it up with you, take pictures with you. But, um, you know, what are some other things, you know, you're working on right now? What, what, do, what do you have in store for the future? Well, I just came back from Japan where I did a, a Nick Cage movie called Prisoners of the Ghost Land. And it's directed by a really cool Japanese director named Sion Sono, S-I-O-N-S-O-N-O. Uh, you know what? Uh I actually have to cut this short because I I think another person is calling. I have another interview. Okay, okay, yeah. Sorry about yeah. It looks like we uh, ran over the time. But before we go, yep. Where can people go online to get more information about you know what you're up to and you know and just plug whatever you have to plug. You know, um, you know on, on social media, I think it's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's at Chop Top Mosley, C H O P T O P M O S E L E Y. Um, and then I also have a website called Chop Tops Barbecue. So it's choptopsbbq.com. And you can go play the crazy piano there. Uh, <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, that's, that's the best way to keep up with me. But social media, usually, if I'm going to be somewhere, I'll post about it and all that stuff. So that's probably the best way. Hey, yo, thank you for listening to this episode of Fresh is the Word, hosted and produced by myself, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier, empowered by Anchor at anchor.fm slash fresh is the word. Intro theme music by Foulmouth, Shimmy Bango, and Knox Money. Fresh is the Word is available on all major streaming platforms. Please rate and review on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you want to support Fresh is the Word, please consider pledging via Patreon at patreon.com slash fresh is the word. Follow Fresh of the Word on social media on Twitter at Fresh of the Pod, on Instagram at Fresh of the Word Podcast, and join the Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Fresh of the Word. For more information about Fresh of the Word and our other podcasts, Breaking Records and Renaissance Soul, and a collection of pop culture articles and reviews, please visit FreshOfThePodcast.com. Thank you for listening and your support. Goodbye and good night. Fresh, 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 fresh is the word.